So uh, welcome to our talk about Ceph and OpenStack at scale. I'm uh, Ben England from Red Hat, uh, Performance and Scale Engineering. And I've got with me Jared King from uh, Cisco Cloud Operations Engineering. And we're going to make this talk. Uh, uh, Jared has a lot of uh, real world experience. He and his team, years of experience with um, deploying Ceph OpenStack clusters. So I thought that would be a really good um, part of any talk like this. And then we're going to talk about uh, Red Hat's own uh, work in the new scale lab um, with Ceph and OpenStack. Uh, and uh, Jared, you want to <laughs> take, it, take it away? Hey, thanks, Ben. So I've been at Red Hat or Cisco for about three years. Um, we've got like uh, nine, there's 11 clusters, depending on what, how you count. So our largest um, cluster is uh, about 750 OSDs. Um, so we had several problems when we first started out. One was latency. Um, some of our clients were just, you know, all over it, all over us about uh, their performance. Um, when you get to a certain size, it gets really hard to pinpoint um, a hardware failure or an OSD failure um, because things it's not entirely obvious by looking at logs and things. Uh, and then what to do with a single host failure. Um, the peering and backfill can be just horrendous when you're trying to, you know, fail over a whole host. So um, at Cisco, we're really big on our alerting. Um, we did that because our clients were just tearing us up. We were a uh, mostly internal cloud. Um, for internal Cisco projects, but they were public facing. So we had, you know, some big names, Spark, a few others that were running on top of us. Um, so we had to, my team was responsible for responding to alerts. Um, within our alerts, we had almost 30,000 alerts uh, in about 15 months. Um, and, you know, like I said, we have 750 OSDs in our largest, and we do use NVMe for journals. Uh, that was a big win for us. Uh, when we first started out, our journals were co-located, and just don't do that ever. It's bad. Um, the performance hit you take is just terrible. Um, so we had to go back and retrofit everything, which we finally got done. So one of the first things that we ended up with was um, being multi-tenant. Um, our we would have you know, one client that would just decide to do some humongous copy job and just crush our Ceph cluster enough to where nobody else could do anything. Um, and then you know, one person was getting all the IO and everybody else was getting nothing or very little. So we implemented throttling. Um, some of the guys at CERN had uh, come up with a way to throttle it using um, some of the burst commands. Um, so what we did was in RCEF, you are throttled to 250 IOPS, uh, and we do allow you to burst, um, but by making that um, limited, then it smoothed everything else out, so everybody got a consistent uh, performance. Uh, it wasn't you know, high speed. It, we had other storage offerings for that. We had local SSDs. Um, but it was a good kind of general purpose storage for pretty much everybody to use, uh, especially for the larger disks. Um, the way we implemented it was on all of our compute nodes, um, we run the command at the bottom in uh, cron, and we log it. So we can always go back and see, like to make sure that it was actually set to, uh, to be throttled and that you know, everything looks right with it. So when you're looking at the logs, you can see how it's got the all good. That one has already been done. And then kind of down at the bottom, uh, that's where it actually wrote or throttled that RBD. Excuse me. Yep. I love the cron job. It's very exceeding, but is there a way to hack it? Is there an open track way or another way? So there is. Yeah. So you have to remember 
like, so we've been doing OpenStack since really, so when I came on, we were doing Havana. Um, and there was no way then. We've continued on to this. Our current version, yes, we're still behind. We're on Icehouse. We've backported a lot of stuff to, from Juno. But we are a production cloud. Um, we're hoping to make it to at least Mataka so we can do some rolling upgrades. But um, we can't take the downtime right now. We, we just, you know, our customers just won't stand for it. So we're kind of limited on where we're here. <laughs> So one of the things that we always were asked, you know, if when we were in the middle of an incident, you know, whether it's a um, Ceph problem, you know, Nova problem, whatever it is, is, is there any tenant impact? So what we did was we came up with these FIO tests. So we've got a VM that reads and writes uh, with a, to a Ceph volume, and then we log it. So if the writes fall below a certain level, then we get an alert. Um, you know, so we can try to keep up with it. And this is more from the tenant perspective, not from the admin perspective, you know, because from what we're able to tell, you know, it's hard to, when you're running just Ceph-S, it's really hard to tell if there's a real tenant impact problem. This gives us what the tenant is actually seeing. Um, so what we do is we run a read and a write and a mixed test for 30 seconds each. Um, you know, it's, um, it works pretty well. Um, we very rarely do we get any false positives out of it. Um, and it's um, helped us out a lot. I mean, we generally can catch things before our tenants start to complain. Um, some of our tenants are very sensitive to IO and um, because any IO problems in Ceph show up as network problems on, to the guests. Uh, and, we have some tenants that will, any type of network latency, they are, you know, on the phone immediately. And so this was a fun one for me. So if you have a drive that's going bad or a controller that's going bad, um, you get blocked IO. It doesn't really make a lot of sense as to where it's coming from. Um, you know, you get the block for more than 120 seconds and console logs all over the place. Um, so everybody goes and runs something along that last line that, you know, some sort of grep, awk, whatever, and pulls out a list of slow OSDs. Well, I've done that many times. And, you know, you'll try to pinpoint the, take the top couple of OSDs and try to figure out the host that's giving you the problem. Um, but it may not be 100%, you know, able to figure out which one it is just by doing it that way. And I know I have personally rebooted the wrong host many times. Um, so one of the, we were on a call one day, and it was a marathon call, and um, we had Red Hat on the line, and one of the guys was like, hey, you need to go look at these scripts. So we pulled them in and ran it, and so this is the output from a real a real problem. This is like my, some of my troubleshooting that I did that day. So this is just a snippet. So you can see that on 21, so, um, OSD 382, you know, the slow primary and slow sub ops, he's higher, but it's not terrible, okay? Um, so what we did was um, we rebooted him just because we were uh, kind of getting to the end of our rope. So this is what the next run. So you can see what 20 looks like. Um, so you got to remember that this is, you know, 75 servers for 750 OSD. So you can scroll down the spreadsheet um, and start to see the pattern. You know, everything is zero. And then all of a sudden you get to 21. And holy cow, does it really jump out at you to see? Um, because if you're just looking at the Ceph log, it, it doesn't take into account you know, sub ops. So the OSD that's complaining the loudest may not actually be the problem. He may just be complaining about somebody else. So by doing this, you can actually see what's going on a little easier and know which host to concentrate on. Um, when we were going through this particular incident, um, like I said, I know I rebooted at least three of the wrong hosts, uh, which wasn't terrible, but, you know, you're trying to want to 
get to the resolution as quickly as you can. So limiting impact failure or failure impact. So when you have so many servers, the you know it's always going to be something's down, something's broken, something's going to go wrong somewhere, pretty much all the time. So instead of um, doing the OSD down, you know for uh, letting it backfill for a single host, we took that part out. So if a single host goes down, backfill won't automatically happen. Um, this gives us a little time to respond um, and also limits impact. So if a host goes down and then we're able to recover it, that peering doesn't have to take place again, and then that backfill. Um, especially in some of the smaller clusters, that peering can be a killer. Um, and you don't want to have to do that more times than you need to. Uh, you want to either fail the host out completely or you know, get it back up. So what this allows us to do is if one is down and it's not coming back, then we'll incrementally remove the OSDs instead of trying to do it all at once. Um, or it gives us a little time to respond. Um, you know, if we've got to get a new controller, drives, chassis, whatever, we can ship it. And it gives us, our guys, enough time to get in and set, you know, no out. Um, so we don't have that, that um, tenant impact, which for us is, you know, the name of the game. So <clears throat> uh, when I started at Red Hat, it was a much smaller company about five years ago. And we didn't have uh, a lab that was anything like the scale that uh, Jared and his, his team have been dealing with. Um, now we do. Uh, it's called the Scale Lab, and you can find out about it at scalelab.redhat.com. And this is a subset of the Scale Lab um, that we used for a set of tests about half a year ago. Uh, so you can see that there's a, a bunch of racks uh, with top of rack switches, all connected to two spine switches um, by 100 gigabit uplinks. Uh, the yellow racks on the four on the right um, are the s external Ceph cluster that we used. Um, for our first um, uh, scale deployment, we decided to create an external Ceph cluster and then connect to that with an OpenStack cluster, uh, which is on the left. So the uh, nodes in the Ceph cluster um, are all uh, uh, two socket Broadwell with 256 gig of RAM, uh, 40 gigabit network card um, and two NVM SSDs, so they're fairly beefy. Um, the OpenStack nodes, there are 20 compute nodes um, that were uh, a little less powerful, um, had 10 gigabit networking. Um, so there's a little bit of an imbalance between the OpenStack side of this configuration and the Ceph side. Uh, and the way we worked around that was that we uh, typically used uh, random I.O. workloads with small transfer size, which tends to shift the bottleneck um, towards the hard drives and away from, you know, and the CPU to some extent, and it shifts the, the load away from the network. Uh, so we deployed this using Ceph Ansible, uh, which at that time was still a little bit new. Uh, and. Uh, it, uh, we had a pre-flight script that just did some of the tasks in the RHCS uh, documentation, like you know, making sure NTP was there or whatever. Um, and uh, that only took like five minutes. And then when we ran Ceph Ansible, uh, I, we increased the fan out to, uh, in, I, th I think it's called fan out, it's dash F anyway in the Ansible playbook command. And we increased it to like 30 because we had 29 OSD nodes. And that allowed all the OSD's nodes to deploy in parallel. At that time, OSD's were being done one at a time on each node. So that wasn't fully parallelized. But uh, the Ceph Ansible developer tells me that's being fixed so that in the future, it will be even faster. But we got it done in a little over an hour for about almost two petabytes of data. So I figure that's not too bad. Um, subsequently, uh, we've, we've gone on to do some work with using OSP Director to deploy Ceph. 
And that's really important for things like hyperconverged storage, uh, where you can't really physically separate, you know, the Ceph OSDs and the um, the uh, Nova. So uh, that's uh, uh, going rather well. We're uh, they had to. There were some um, bug fixes that are going into RHOSP 11 and some of them into 10 ZStream. Um, that will allow director to do the Ceph deployment at scale. Um, and um, all the things that we found while we were deploying with um, the external Ceph cluster, there was a couple of bugs we found there that were fixed, and those all should be available to you now, including making it work at 1,000 OSDs. Um, so back in this diagram, uh, it shows 788, but when we started out, we had four racks, not three. So we were deploying with 1,000. And it turned out that there was some uh, problems with the default tunings uh, for file descriptors, for example. Um, so when the Nova guest came up, it could only create 1,024 file descriptors. And when you have that many OSDs, it needs to be able to create sockets to talk to all of them. So that was a problem. And that's been fixed. And there was some other problem with kernel.pidmax uh, kernel parameter that's been fixed. So you should be able to get this kind of scale out of the box now. Now, once we got it working, um, we then created and populated uh, a storage pool that consumed over 50% of the space. The reason we do that is because if you buy multiple petabytes of storage, you don't buy it to have it sit empty. <laughs> and uh, the, the way that Ceph behaves when the storage is near full for things like uh, failover and recovery is very different, obviously. So we wanted to simulate that. And then we created and populated 100 gigabyte cinder volumes for each of our 512 guests uh, so that we could, the reason we did that is because we wanted to make sure that the cinder volumes were collectively big enough that Ceph couldn't cache them. Otherwise, it's kind of a meaningless test if it all gets into memory. Um, then we um, measured throughput and latency as a function of guest count. Um, that's not the most interesting thing, so I'm not going to talk about it much here. It's just you get, a, you get the obvious curve from you know, doing one guest, two guests, four guests, powers of two up to 512. Um, but then what we did, um, is, sorry, I went ahead one slide there. Um, then we throttled back the workload to 80% of the capacity, because you, you typically you don't want to operate your cluster at the absolute limit of what the hardware can do, because then if you need to do something like, um, you know, if, if you have to replace a disk or, you know, if a node goes offline or whatever, you're, you're uh, you don't have any spare capacity to do any healing or anything like that. So um, we throttled it back a little bit, and then we simulated removing and replacing different components like monitors, um, hard drives, and nodes. And uh, while we were doing this, we're running the workload the whole time, and we're measuring the effect on response time, and particular latency percentiles, because we think that's, that's more representative of sort of the user experience. In other words, the only response time you care about is yours. You, know, you don't care what the average response time is. That's, that's no consolation at all if, if your particular guest isn't getting I.O. response. So um, let's talk about how that worked a little bit, so you know what we're measuring. Uh, we developed um, a new methodology to look at latency percentiles as a function of time. And it's called uh, histogram logging, and it's, it's upstream. And it is uh, documented, maybe not as much as it should be, but it's there uh, in FIO. And uh, you can see the, the syntax for it. Uh, it causes the FIO process to periodically log a histogram record um, and we'll talk about more how FIO, what FIO does with, you know, internally and what it's logging in a second. But it logs these histogram records, and then after the test is done, 
you can run a script that will merge these records together from all the different FIO processes and all the guests. And you can get a cluster-wide latency histogram. And from that, you can get latency percentiles. Um, and we think this is a more scalable and accurate way to, uh, to, to get what we want. FIO already had histograms. It already had histograms within each process. Uh, so if you look in the code in FIO stat.h, you'll find some comments that talk about exactly how, the, how this works. And so a histogram in FIO is just an array of counters. And so each array element is counting the number of IO requests that completed in a certain time, you know, in a certain latency range. Um, and FIO divides up the, these array elements called histogram buckets into groups. And within each group, um, all of the buckets within that group have the same, uh, the same width uh, latency range. And then there's 19 bucket groups. And each bucket group has double the latency range of the preceding bucket. And that's really important because the range of latencies that we have to deal with is so enormous. We can go all the way from latencies in the microseconds to latencies in minutes, you know, in the very worst case that you could conceivably measure. And so uh, this sort of exponential um, uh, uh, behavior with the bucket groups allows it to capture that huge range. In a re and the fact that you have multiple buckets within each group lowers the inaccuracy. Um, of the um, measurement. Uh, and the last bucket catches all the latencies in the preceding buckets. So uh, all the latencies greater than the preceding bucket. So if you have a latency that's like 200 seconds or something like that, it's going to get lumped in with the, late, the maximum latency for the, the, the highest bucket that you have, which by default, FIO compile, you know, is 16.7 is seconds. Um, that's a, something that can be adjusted at compile time, but it can't be adjusted at runtime. And we didn't get around to adjusting it in this set of runs. So um, that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at the graphs. And we didn't think that was a big problem because, hey, once you get up to that point, um, you know, does it does it really matter if it was you know 16 seconds or 100 seconds? It's too high, you know. So. Uh, the, so you get these uh, latency logs. And so how do you actually construct a cluster-wide histogram? Well, all you have to do, since they're just counters, is you just add them, um, the, the corresponding buckets, from all the different FIO processes. And it's a little more complicated than that. So I kind of lied. But because the FIO processes are a little bit time skewed with each other. Um, so you can't really say that, you know, what's in bucket one, um, you know, for the third record is exactly the same time interval as, you know, on this node as is it on this node. But um, you can uh, you can account for that with uh, weighting. Um, you can you can use um, there's some methods that you can see in the code, but based for conceptually, it's just adding the um, buckets together. And then finally, um, to get the percentile, you take this cluster-wide histogram. You, you add all the samples together to get all of the IO requests um, in that interval. And then you, uh, to get the percentile, you just start summing from the beginning um, until you get to 95% of um, that total. And the latency, the max latency for that bucket is your 95th percentile, and same with the 99th percentile. So that, I just wanted to go over what we were measuring so that when you look at these graphs, you kind of have some of that context um, if you haven't seen it before. So we get these nice, we get these graphs. Um, it's a little hard to read in the raw form produced by PBench FIO, which is our, the tool that we're using, uh, which runs FIO and collects the performance data from the cluster. Uh, because the, uh, 
because of the enormous range of latencies that we have to deal with. Um, so you can see that in this graph, like the gold is the 99th percentile, and that's way down at the bottom. Uh, and the blue is maximum latency, and that's you know at the top. You know, so you can't even you can barely even see the 95th percentile. So in all the subsequent graphs, you're going to see a logarithmic y-axis um, because that's that's just works better for latency. So we went and did this for these three failure domains. Um, uh, monitor, OSD, and OSD node. For monitor, we didn't see any effect at all. You could take a monitor out, put it back in. There was no, and that's what you would expect from Ceph because once uh, the Ceph uh, client has got the, uh, Rados client has got the uh, cluster map, it talks directly to the OSDs. It doesn't need to talk to the monitor to get its data. So, um, that, that was a non-issue. Um, so here's a graph of um, simulated OSD failure and recovery. So what we do here is, this is a fairly long test. If you look at the x-axis, it's about five hours. Uh, and so you'll see the first half hour, we don't really do anything except run the thing normally and let it warm up. Because in the, before we start the test, we completely clear out all the caches. Um, in all the nodes so that we have um, no, nothing that happened before the test has any effect on the, the performance. Um, and so the first half hour here, I've got a pointer, I'm going to use it, darn it. Um, first half hour uh, is just, you can see that the um, latency is coming down and the throughput was coming up. The throughput is in bright red. Um, and then you see this, uh, this marker here where, uh, called rebalance start, where we um, took out the OSD. And we don't, just take, we don't just take down the OSD daemon, we clear out the, the, you know, the drive. So it's like you were putting a new disk in. Um, and uh, you can see that you know, there's a little drop down in throughput and a little spike in latency, but it comes back down. And so the gold is the max latency. That's the worst possible latency that you can find in the system. The, uh, and um, the, you can see down here, that's the 99th percentile and that's under a second. So 99 out of 100 requests complete that fast. Um, and uh, the 95th percentile is all the way down to between like a third, well, a half, it starts at a half a second and it's going down to like a fifth of a second. So that's all good. Um, so that's a significant improvement over what we saw in Ceph Hammer, which is what Jared was dealing with, I believe, and uh, where we measured much higher spikes um, go ahead. Here's a question. Um, I think there was a, somewhat of a caching effect there because even though we dropped cache, if you run the thing for five hours, eventually Ceph's going to start to cache data. Okay, so um, there is some warming up going on here. Well, uh, it's okay. So that's a good point. I should have gone over that. We're doing a random read write. Oops. I guess I can't be trusted with this thing. All right, let me get back to where we were, right here. Um, this is a random rewrite mix, 4K IOs. Um, and uh, so it's, that's a fairly typical you know, test pattern for Ceph. And uh, does that answer your question? All right, well. <laughs> Let, let's let's think think about that. All right, so um, we talked about how Hammer was, um, you know, not as good as RHC. This is Jewel that that was the graph you were just looking at, and this is Hammer. So where we were seeing latency spikes, um, and even the 95th percentile was was spiking pretty high. And I, we believe that the change that was made that did this was the priority queuing in Ceph. What was put in. And uh, um, so that's, that's a really good result. 
here's, now we're looking at a graph where we're taking down the entire node and clearing it out like it was, you know, like the node was destroyed and we put a new one in, you know. So that's like a worst case, you know. Um, and you look at the, um, again, we, it's a longer test, so we're, sorry about that. I guess I'm not that good with this thing. Oh. Um, almost there. There. All right. So um, it's a, almost a 12 hour test. Um, and again, we let it warm up for a half an hour. We take the node down. And um, you can see the throughput's gone down. And, um, but the, the interesting thing about this is what's not bad. OK, so the 95th percentile doesn't spike. Um, that just hums along. The 99th percentile even doesn't really spike. You know, it goes up a little, but we're still um, under a second, OK? Um, what, but the max latency, which is, that's the maximum recorded latency that we can find in all those I.O. requests. And it was doing, you know, tens of thousands of I.O. requests per second. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's gotten very high. And in fact, if you look at the latency logs that were also collected, we were seeing latencies much higher than 16 seconds. So this is just the limitation of this compile, the, the compile time parameters of FIO that's clipping it there. So that's not so good, right? And that's the, the reason that we're doing these things is that we want to know you know, if we've heard of concerns like Jared expressed, and we want to know if there's something going on there and start to do something about it. And um, so now we're actually seeing the thing that, that we heard people mentioning, but that we could never see before. And um, so another thing that we looked at, so go ahead. Well, I, I think at, I think what happened there is probably the, um, the, the thing got started to, to get healed. Because you can see the red is the throughput. And the gold is like 99th percentile. And um, but so OK, the warm up is way over there. Can you see where I'm pointing? And if you look at there, there's 24 minutes. So it's just that little bit in the very far left. So, um, so th that was, I think what happened is it, it didn't get healed until the FIL workload had, exit, had exited. So you, you know. Um, so we'll get back to a discussion about this at the end. But I want to just tell you briefly about what else we did. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so the other thing we did is looked at the monitor database size, because um, we, we'd heard uh, somebody express a concern about that. Um, and so when you do this node power down and power up, what you see is the monitor database starts out about less than half a gig, and it grows to about 10 gig. And the reason for this is that um, Ceph has to maintain a lot of state about placement groups and that are changing as a result of having to shuffle the data around when, when this node goes down. So it, um, the database does get bigger, but as soon as you get to health OK, well, it comes right back, compacts right back down again to half a gig. And when you bring the node back online, same thing. It's shuffling data back onto that node. And then when health OK is reached, it compacts back down. Everything's great. But there was one day, <laughs> the day before Thanksgiving, of course, um, these things always happen at the, at the best possible time. And it was like uh, people, my family was starting to walk in the door, you know, and like everything was going great. And then I, I'm all of a sudden, I'm, I'm hearing that there's some problem with the Ceph cluster. 
And uh, so what happened, it wasn't really Ceph at all. Um, it was a network partitioning that happened on the, the different racks in the scale lab. And um, we've since fixed that, but at the time, um, some of the Ceph racks couldn't talk to other racks all of a sudden. And what happens is, so Ceph tries to immediately go and repair itself. It has like a five minute timeout where it, and then it marks the OSDs out and it tries to shuffle the data around like it always does. Only it's 70% full. So you take away like a half of its storage and it's 70% full. There's no way that it can recover from that. You know, it's not, the, there's, there's, you know, you, you just can't put, you know, 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag. And, it, but it will try. <laughs> and it gets all stressed out doing that. And the monitor database um, jumped up to like 60 gig. The system disk filled up. Then we lost quorum. And then I had to go and um, be with my family. So <laughs> it was great. Um, perfect excuse. But, um, but uh, the, the, the moral of the story is that you have to think ahead about this thing. And, and um, there's a couple things. I mean, Jared covered a lot of this, which is that if you, you know, if you know you're doing maintenance or there's something wrong, you can, you can, that's at a node level and it's not a real data loss, you can mark the cluster and put the cluster in maintenance mode so that the Ceph isn't thrashing around with the data. And then you can fix the node, then you can, unset no out and get back out of maintenance mode and you're fine. Um, Ceph can very quickly detect that the data is still there. Um, and if you want to prevent an automatic node level backfill, you can do that. I am totally incompetent with this flicker. Wow. So uh, uh, you can, um, uh, just make sure that if an entire host goes down, the uh, OSDs won't be marked out. Um, and that uh, the default for Ceph is that if a rack goes down, it won't mark the OSDs out. But this, this changes the setting so that it's at a node level. And it, um, if you do that, you can uh, create less disruption in your cluster. Um, so why are we telling them all these terrible things about Ceph? We're not doing it to say that Ceph is bad. Ceph is great. It's just that it's, it was software and it has limitations like every other piece of software. And if you know what those are, you can have a really successful deployment with it. And you know, so that's what we're telling you. Um, and I think in the long run, there might be some things that can be done to make this node level failover not have these max latency spikes um, in the, because we can, what seems to be happening is that there's very few requests that are having this latency problem. And my suspicion, which I need to do some more research on, is that we could throttle the per placement group backfilling, but um, backfill more PGs in parallel. And in that way, we can keep you know, from imposing a high latency on any particular OSD. And uh, so um, that's about all we, oh, there's one other thing I wanted to just mention because some gentleman, I think it was you, brought up the uh, question about how OpenStack, um, you know, how could you do this uh, um, guest throttling in OpenStack? And there's an article which is in the, URL at the top, but this is the short version um, of it. So um, there's some cinder commands that you can use. Uh, and um, so that might be a way that's easier in the sense that you don't have to constantly be going and looking for virtual machines, you know, to run, run that script. So, um, and that's about all we have. Um, and uh, thank you for coming and uh, hope that was helpful. And are there any questions or anything? Okay, so that's a good point. The, he asked whether what you do when your monitor file system fills up. Because remember we were talking about, um, we were talking about this problem, right? 
where the database filled up the, um, uh, and what, what, you, what, what I had to do was I had to NFS mount, you know, some, some file system with more disk space and, and then um, move it over there and then get the monitor back online. Once it gets back online, you can get it healthy, and then once it gets healthy, it will come back down. But it's, a, it's painful, right? So, right? so I've experienced this. Like, mine weren't that bad. But so what we do is we monitor root file systems. We are Nagios. So we monitor root file systems. We also have checks that monitor uh, Ceph DB size. So if it does get so big, we have an alert that goes off, and I think ours is like two or four gig. So if it, which should give us plenty of time to respond before, you know, it melts down. So what we've done is we Ansible playbook everything. And then we write an article. If the playbook doesn't fix it, then they page on call. But if it's an OSD that's down, we playbook. Uh, remove a host is a playbook. Um, everything is a playbook. So that's much easier and a lot less scary to give somebody that may not be as experienced as your you know, normal storage guy that he can go and run this and kind of follow the instructions and see what looks right and what doesn't. And if anything falls outside of that, you know, page on call. <laughs> yep. Any, any other questions? I think we got to get out because there's uh, another, maybe another talk, but thank you for coming though. <laughs>